Hey YouTube, it's PB. Thanks for tuning in to another Life of a Jobbing Plumber. Got a lot of little um, bits, tips, boilers, toilets, things for you this week. So I hope you're going to enjoy it. Um, this bit of the start, I always like to do a little bit of an intro. I probably don't need to do them as much anymore. There's always a bit of me apologising for sort of the lateness of the video. I know it's been three weeks for this one, but I have been really busy at work. I've had such a lot of work on. Been to Tool Fair, been doing stuff for World Plumbers over on Instagram. If you have been sick of waiting for this, do go and follow me over on Instagram. So do do something there every single day. So there's content on there every day, little tool reviews, work tips, things like that. So you should enjoy that. If you don't already follow me, check that out. Uh, Twitter as well, I do stuff on there. But yeah, hope you enjoy this video. Um, there should be another one up very soon. I've got a lot of content, been filming all my jobs. It's just finding the time to edit that I always struggle with. So yeah, hope you enjoy this. Thanks for tuning in. Right team, this is a Worcester High Flow 440. It's like a storage combi, so it's a combi boiler with some stored water in the bottom. Now, um, I could replace it, they still make these, but I've quoted them to fit a boiler above the worktop there. Now, while I was doing this job, um, the PRV wasn't working, so to drain the water content in the boiler, I needed to open this little tap, and I couldn't fit my hose on that, the end of that tap. So this thing I've got here is called a Versa funnel, made by Nerad Tools. It's basically a piece of rubber you can fold up and put in your kit bag, and it's great for stuff like this, for diverting the water away from components and stuff. So um, what I wanted to show you on this is the controls. Now, yeah, when you fit, um, so as far as I see it, when you fit a boiler, it's always best to use the manufacturer's own controls because they've been designed to work with that boiler. And the other thing is, they plug straight in, so Worcesters, um, Valence, when you use their own controls, it's easy, they just plug straight in. You've not got to worry about running extra cables to external controls, wiring up, literally, this plugs in and then it's ready to go. So you take the blanking plate off the front, and we can see there we've got the pins that stick out. That's for when you, that piece there is for when you use it externally. But basically now, all we need to do is line the, those pins up with the holes on the back of this, and it just pushes straight on. Um, so the more money you spend on the control, because this is probably more expensive than a, your standard external control, you save an installation time, because that's took me, what, 10 seconds to fit that? So it's always worth considering. I know they may seem expensive, but the amount of time it saves you is worth it. So this is the finished job. Um, you can see there the board has gone from underneath, and then we've rearrange the pipes to come up to the boiler i was quite pleased with this one it's turned out quite nice um shined the pipes up with just fine fine grade steel wool swaged all my sockets there if you're wondering what this is this is a gas test point which i've put in on the gas you don't get one on the boiler with this so it's handy for checking the working pressure the incoming pressure at the boiler rather than at the gas meter and then on this side, we've got a Spiratech. This is an MB3, which is a magnetic filter, similar to your MagnaClean. This one's a special one though. It comes with the boiler as part of a valent protection pack and it enables you to bump up to 10 year warranty. This one on the left is a deaerator. So you fit these as close to the boiler as you can on the flow and it basically strips out micro air bubbles from the system. Now, the way they sell these to you is if you've got no air in the system, you've got nothing to react with the metals in the pipe work and in the radiators, so nothing to create sludge. So that's the idea of that. So it's a nice combination to have, and they're nice as well because they're brass, they look good. Um, and then this is the control which I showed you before. A lot of people don't like valent controls because they think they're complicated, but this is really simple. As I said before, you plug that in, turn the power on, and it's ready to go. So I'll just show you here the way we change the temperature. So the big number there is the room temperature 21 and it tells you their desired temperature 25. So when we change it up, it tells you exactly what you're doing. Desired day temperature only today, changing it up to 28 and then to change that permanently, you just press OK. If you let go, it's just for the day and it's as easy as that. They are, um, you can do a lot more on valent controls as you can with the boilers you can range rate the uh, the central heating down there's a lot you can do but the basic functions that your customers will want are pretty simple as well 
So yeah, that was a nice little job. That This took me two days. I did uh, remove the boiler on the first day, did a power flush, and then installed the boiler on the second day. But yeah, that's that. Right guys, this is a call out to a uh, no heating, no hot water. So I've checked inside, this is in the garage, the boiler. Check the program inside, check the room stats calling, that's all okay, so we then come to the boiler. I pretty much know what it is straight away, but I'm just gonna show you quickly. So we've got the um, stat here. If we turn that off, you can hear it's silent. There is a slight noise, which is the pump spinning in the airing cupboard next door. But if you listen when I turn this on, and I'm going to hold this near the fan. You can hear that faint buzzing. So the first thing that needs to happen before your boiler will fire up is the fan needs to spin. Because if the fan's not spinning, the boiler won't fire. And that's due to the air pressure switch, which is on these at the back there. So the way I would test this, apart from the fact that I can hear it um, and it's not going, Here's my voltage tester. I'm just going to get my two probes here. I'm trying to do this with one hand. I've not got the chair in my with me. And you can see there, the two cables sort of mould into the motor there. But they're on these two pins here, so we'll put that one on. Excuse me. Okay, so I've got the two together in, and we should be reading, if it works, 240 volts. So we know we've got 240 volts there, but the fan's not spinning. So that tells me it's not a board fault, there's nothing else wrong. That's doing what it's doing, it's sending the power there. The next step is the fan to come on, air pressure switch makes, boiler fires, so new fan. What I can do while I'm here, because this is an emergency call out, it's half eight at night, I can try and free it and put some lube on that fan just to get them going. So we'll see if we can do that. Okay, so you can see there, I've got the boiler working. I've freed the fan up, but it's really noisy. Definitely needs replacing. But we have got them heating the hot water for the night. So I'll get a quote in um, tomorrow morning. I'll ring emergency, just get a quote in for that. Hi guys, it's PB. So you see a lot of shiny copper pipes on Twitter and Instagram these days. And a lot of people mention this stuff, Brasso. Now I thought that was a bit of an in-joke, but apparently a lot of people do use this. Me personally, I use fine grade steel wool. So I thought I'd do a little bit of an experiment. So I've got three pipes I've soldered here. I'm going to clean one up with steel wool, one with Brasso, and one with this copper polish. And we'll compare the results and see if life is really too short for Brasso.
Okay, so we've got three very shiny pipes there. What I will say looking at them is, the Brasso is probably the shiniest out of the three, but it's not that much of improvement on just the fine steel wool, so I think I'll be sticking to that. Um, whether the Brasso gives you a longer lasting shine is debatable, but the time it takes, the extra effort, I think I'll leave it. Yeah, so this is the job. Um, it's basic system conversion. Floor standing boiler came out and changed it to a combi. Now I'm always doing jobs like this and the pictures are literally just straight pipes and filters and it gets a bit boring so I was thinking of something I could do that was interesting and that's when I came up with the idea of comparing Brasso with fine steel wool, stuff like that. Now the one really interesting thing about this is I was doing a magna cleanse on this job um, as part of the as part of the job. Now there's only four, five radiators on this job so there's not much come out of it but I use my thermal imaging camera when I'm doing a magna cleanse or a power flush to check that I'm doing you know getting everything out of the radiators and it was working fine with the radiators but when I tried to film the pipe work from the boiler it wasn't showing up and I actually thought my thermal imaging camera had broken but when I looked into it apparently the shine or shiny surfaces affect how your thermal imaging camera works so because these pipes were so shiny because of the brasso it was interfering with the camera so if i show you now when i put the thermal imaging camera onto the pipes this is with the heating and hot water running you can see there the thermal imaging it's not really picking up much from the pipes and that's because of the shine which i just thought was interesting and yeah that a few of you would want to know Hi guys, it's PB. As you know, I've taken over the Well Plumbers account this week and I just wanted to use this opportunity to share a bit of a message with you. Being a sole trader sometimes can be quite lonely and you've got a lot of stress, a lot of responsibility on your shoulders and it can feel like you've got the weight of the world on there and it can get you down. But the important thing is, it's okay to not be okay. And if you're feeling like that, just reach out to one of your brothers on social media because I guarantee you, you're not the only person who's going through it. And there's guys out there willing to help you with experience, they're older, wiser, they've been through it and they've come out the other side. And they'll reassure you, they'll help you out to realise that it's not that bad. So I guess what I'm trying to say is be part of the community and if you do need anyone, don't be afraid to reach out and talk about it. Right, this next video is for any of you guys whose hearts sink when you see a concealed cistern. So if you turn up to a job, you see something like this and you think, great, how am I going to get into work on that? It's going to be a right nightmare. You're looking in the top for an inspection hatch. It's been glued right up against the basin. You're thinking, I'm going to have to cut a hole in this to get to it. Stop what you're doing, chill out, and let me tell you how it works. So this front panel will just pop off. Now it might seem like it's not going to. It might seem like it's been glued in or screwed in or whatever, and it might have been, but normally it will just pop away. So get a flat screwdriver or a little mini wrecking bar or something and very carefully just tease it out so you don't want to damage it and it will just pull away. It's just on a couple of clips which I'll show you now when I take this off. So there's black lugs there, it just pops in. So you just pull that off and then if you need to get any further down you can take this back piece off here. Now what you will normally find is that the pan has been siliconed between the pan and the back there so you will have to cut that out. But once you've done that, it just lifts up. So from the bottom, get your hand underneath and you can just pull it up both sides. Now I do struggle with this because using one hand, so I just set the camera down. But it should literally be as easy as that. If you can't just pull it up easily, then they might have put some screws in, so you'll have to have a bit of a more in-depth look. But I was looking on this one, no silicon, no screws, just lifted straight off. And now you can access everything behind that toilet that you need to work on. For me on this job it was nice and simple, just a straightforward float valve swap, so I've stuck a Viva 4-in-1 valve in there, nice and easy. And then the same principle applies when you're putting it back together, in reverse order, so slot this one down first, and then the, um, the one with the push button on pushes back on. Just check if you have disconnected it that you put those cables on right if it's an air operated one like that, because it does matter. Um, but yeah, that should just push on back into those black clips and when you're finished it will look like nobody's even been there and worked on it. Just like that. A 
quick look at an old heat only boiler here um, for the younger lads. So basically we've got heat exchanger there, so the water circulates inside that and the gas burns from that bed there and heats the heat exchanger above it which heats the water in the system and then it goes via an S-plan or a Y-plan diverted to the heat in the hot water. So there's basically nothing to this boiler. We've got a thermostat there on the right, we've got a gas valve, we've got an overheat cut out there which basically interrupts the thermocouple. So if the boiler did overheat, say there was no water in it or the pump wasn't working, it would interrupt your thermocouple there and knock the pilot light out. It's a basic safety device. Your other one is obviously the pilot light. So the pilot lights onto that thermocouple, tells the gas valve, yeah, the pilot's on and the gas comes on. And that's basically it. And then you've got a basic thermostat as well, which controls the temperature. And that's pretty much it. There's nothing really to these boilers. Um, as long as you can still get parts for them, they could last years. Um, a lot of them will take a universal gas valve, universal thermocouple. Um, so yeah, mainly things like a split heat exchanger would be what kills this boiler off. Right, a bit of fault finding here on the system. So I've been called out to this for no heating, no hot water. The boiler is firing, but it's getting red hot. So straight away that points me to the pump. So I've come up to the airing cupboard and you can hear there the pump isn't spinning. You'd be able to hear if it was spinning, you'd be able to feel it. And when I change the settings, if we listen carefully, you can hear it there. It's just groaning a bit, trying to turn, but it's not. And it's also red hot. Now using my thermal imaging camera, I showed the customer this. The fact that your pump's hot means the motor is struggling, it's trying to turn it, but because it's stuck, the motor's getting too hot. So if we take the centerpiece out, we can check. We might be able to free this pump because there is a point in the pump where you can get a screwdriver in to try and force turn it. Now you can see here, when I undo this, there's actually steam coming out because the pump's so hot, it's boiling the water inside it. Listen to that, you can hear it and you can see all that steam coming out of there. So when we get that bit out, inside there you can see, and you should be able to see it spinning, but it's not, it's completely still. If you jam a screwdriver in, you can try and turn it to free it, but this one's completely seized up. If your pump is spinning, when you put your screwdriver in, you'll feel it turning and it'll kick back against your screwdriver. So I'll just quickly show you on this new pump. We've took the centerpiece out there, and you can see inside the pump, you've got that little point there that you can get a screwdriver into. And when the pump's free, you'll be able to turn it just like that easily. You can also check on a pump, say you were working on a boiler and you think that the pump's struggling. While it's running, if you try and jam a screwdriver in and try and stop the pump, you shouldn't be able to easily stop a pump from spinning with a screwdriver. So that will tell you if you can stop it that your pump's weak. So, got myself another Van Volt slider. This is a little video I made for Instagram, so it's sped up because it's a minute long. Basically, I saw someone else who had um, two Van Volt sliders at the back of the van, and I thought it was a great idea. One, for security, but two, it's unbelievable how much stuff you can get inside these things. They're deceptively big. So, yeah, like I say, this is a little install video. The story behind this is um, I had to raise the floor in the back of my van, that metal frame that you can see there, to get the first one in. Once I'd done that, I knew another one would just slide straight in so it would be an easy job. You can screw it to the floor, bolt it to the side. Mine's bolted to the metal bars at the side, the uprights and to the base. And then I got this checker plate rubber matting. It's really thick rubber matting off eBay, which I lined them in to stop things rattling around. 
Um, and yeah, really pleased with it. You can see there, it's a perfect fit. And also really luckily, it just misses the handle on my van vice. So you can see there, you've got masses and masses of storage and they really keep the van nice and organized. Now you're gonna see a little video of some extras I got for them. So guys, PB, I know you've seen these before, but I've got a new addition. To the Van Volt slider, it's these slider dividers. So you gave me packs of two. Got myself four there. And you can see in the side of the Van Volt, you've got these options there where you can slide the dividers into. They just pull out, it's a sheet of steel like that, painted the same color as the Van Volt. The one thing I will say is this one at the back here, you probably won't use because when you drop that in, with this slider fully out, you can't really access all that space in there. But other than that, I think they're really good and you can chop and change them to suit your needs. Hi guys, it's PB. This is a special PBTV on my Instagram TV. We're gonna be talking all things Vito Pro Pack. Now, I've got a lot of Vito gear. It's all the tech range, the tech pack range. Um, so I'm gonna talk through with you that, show you how I use them. Um, but before we start, so I'll just tell you about um, how I got into Vito. So I saw a few guys using them on social media and I started to do my research and it took me absolutely ages to decide which kit bag was the one for me. I couldn't work out, looking at videos on YouTube, pictures, stuff like that, how I was gonna adapt it for my kit, how my kit would fit into one. So in the end, after about three months of just watching YouTube videos, I ordered a Tech LC and a Tech LC, well, the bigger one, the XL. And then when I got them to my house, I had a look at them, sized them up, put my kit in, and then I decided I didn't want either, so I sent them back. Then another month went by and I was still watching these videos online, still thinking how could I get, because I really wanted one of these bags. So I ordered the Tech LC again and then I sort of, the second time I got it I thought yeah okay this is going to be good. So we're going to look through um, all my kit now, starting with this. So this is your TP4, I don't know there's an alarm going off in the background. This is a TP4 and it's like a, a grab bag with a handle. It's got a clip on the back here which you can attach it to your other larger bags on the tape loop. So I'll just run through with you. Um, I don't know the specifics on how many pockets but you can see that we've got a lot of stuff in there. So I'm just gonna show you like in the side there, I've got my utility knife, a um, couple of joker spanners, a pen. There's a loop on there you could attach something to. In the front here, I've got my tool check plus, okay, and then that I will use in conjunction with my speed zip up ratchet there on the side. So with that and that in this bag, I've got pretty much a socket set, driver set that will do anything. Electrical testing gear, screwdrivers, um, fluke pen in there. I've got a Weira compact screwdriver with all different bits in. Sorry, three pairs of channel lock grips in there. There's room for this mini little wrecking bar I use for getting up, getting bath panels out, floorboards up and stuff. Again, um, a decent uh, chisel driver. I've got a torch in the side there, there's room for that. Um, some scissors, a pair of pliers, set hex keys. So this bag, what I use this for is, it's in the back. If I've been called out to a boiler fault or a leak somewhere, rather than take my big bag in, I'll just grab this out of the van, take it in. So before I know what I'm looking at, it might be something that I can fix with this bag. Save me getting my bigger kit bag. Got a multi-pipe slice there, the rigid 2215 pipe slice. So with that little bag, grab it out of the van, go and do a job. That's that. They also do this one, which is the TP3. That's the four, that's slightly bigger. Let's just show you the sizes there. It's just a slightly smaller version. Again, you can clip it onto your kit bag there with the tape loop, and then show you the pockets inside. That's roughly the setup. On this one, you've got a few more, but that's roughly what it is. This is leather, really well made. Now, the um, there are new versions of these called the TP3B, and I think there's a TP4B coming out, which has got a rubber, 
or a plastic base. The trouble with these is because you've got this ridge of material there, what can happen is when you stand it up, it will tip over. Okay, at the minute, the way I've got mine, they're not, but sometimes the way you load them out, they can be inclined to just tip over, which gets very annoying. But they've sorted that out with the new models. So that's those. Then we'll look at Tech MCT. So this is quite a small little bag. See there? You can get a lot in it though. I showed this one yesterday on my Instagram. But inside here, so I've got some LDF, bag of smoke bombs, smoke matches, and there's room in here for my analyzer, hoses, charger, temperature clamps. I've got a gas leak sniffer in there, thermometer, uh, pressure gauge. My probe is a short probe. You can't get the long probe in this with your um, cane analyzer. I don't know about other brand of analyzers. But you can't get a long probe in there. Got room on the side for pens and things. That's just a torque screwdriver for taking off valent and glowworm boilers. Tape loop on the side there for tape measure, or if you want to stick one of these little TP3 bags on, that just clips on there like that, increasing the size. And that's see, that's how that attaches there. Um, then we've also got zip pockets on the front. There's loads of these little loops that you can attach things to, whatever you want to attach onto there. And you can see in this one, I've got so much stuff in here. Screwdrivers, grips, uh, socket set. I've got a, um, the word escapes me. Um, yeah, it'll come to me in a second. Wire wall, uh, brushes, boiler servicing gear. Um, so that's the Tech MCT. Then we've got the Tech OTMC, which is an open tote. I love this bag. When I bought this bag, I had my heart set on using it for soldering, but I couldn't get everything in that I wanted to, so I had to modify it. But you get vertical storage pockets, like in the front there. You can see I've got all my tools there in the vertical pockets. On the other side, I wanted to put flux and things in, so I took the vertical section out so I can put other things in there. So it's like an open. In the middle, you've got a removable tub, which I've got wire wool, cleaning strips in there, room for your gas torch, and I've got my cleaning mat and a some other bits in there so that's a really nice little bag i really like that one my main kit bag is the tech lc so you'll see here i've got a petzl head, head torch i've just attached it onto one of these loops with some cable ties and i do that a lot same with my hammer loop on the side there that's just off a, off a screwdriver i've attached that on and then i can keep my hammer in there the reason for that is, on bags like this, the Tech LC, and even the XL in this version, it's not tall enough to fit a hammer in, or a 300mm screwdriver. It's the only downside. You won't get things like uh, manometer tubes in there. It's just not the right size. Still good though. So, in this one, we have got a lot of room in the front. Let's push. So I've got a bag there full of stubby screwdrivers, bit holders and things. And then we've got a full set of joker spanners in there. My Stabila boat level, hex keys, rat, uh, ratchet and pipe cutter. I've got a screwdriver set there, brush, tub of Boss White, pipe slices, ratchet pipe slice. Um, still loads of room in there, I could put more in there if I wanted to. And then, how are we doing for time? Eight minutes, okay. In this side, all vertical storage. Got a standing knife in there, junior hacksaw tucked in, different screwdrivers, spanners. Um, get back in there. Got aviator snips, plastic pipe cutters in there, chisel drivers, um, more spanners, chisels cutters, nut spinners, 
And this is my main sort of plumbing bag. You get a um, strap so you can carry it into the job on your shoulder or there's a special hook on the strap there if you want to just hook it on the handle to keep it nicely stored out of the way. Right, tech, pack, backpack. This isn't mine, this is one I've got for a giveaway which um, has been one unfortunately for everyone watching but I'm just going to run through some of the features on this. So we got storage at the front, zip pocket and pouch and then it opens up inside we've got loads of pockets here all vertical storage pockets neoprene so they stretch um, and there'll be a zip there's two sort of pockets there on the front we've got a zip see-through bag and then a zip section there same on the side tape tape loop side pockets and then on the back you've obviously got a backpack strap so you can wear it and then check this out in the back we've got a large zip pocket on the front there that fills the whole thing and then some larger neoprene pockets here for the bigger tools um, smaller pockets a zip section that goes all the way across the top loads of pockets there it's absolutely massive so that's it that's my veto stuff it's Thanks for watching, hope that was helpful. I had to get through it fast because you only get 10 minutes on these Instagram TV videos, but any questions, drop me a message. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, it's PB. It's Would You Rather Wednesday. Okay, would you rather be working on a kitchen tap, monoblock mixer tap, and the kitchen fit has put two carcasses together, so where they join is right bang on where the tap is. You can't get on it, and for whatever reason, the water don't quite turn off. So when you're lying on your back, in the cupboard, arms there, you've got some water dripping down your arm all the way into your armpit. Horrible job. Or you drive driving home tonight, you get a phone call. It's the gaffer. Need you to nip to a quick job on the way home. He's not asking you, he's telling you. But then he says those four words that nobody wants to hear. It won't take you long. Five words. What would you rather do?